Our next uh, conversation will be around quantum and cloud and the future of financial services. Quantum is uh, obviously a, a super emerging, super exciting uh, technology. With the additional computational power that it gives us, we can do all sorts of crazy things in risk modeling, credit modeling, portfolio calculation. Um, but unfortunately, it also has the side effects that it kind of bypasses a lot of uh, the assumptions made for our current cryptography and therefore security. So we have to balance those two sides, and we're going to have a group to discuss that. Um, we'll be chaired by Professor David Lee. Professor, please, over to you. So good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. So I'm so glad to see so many of you here this afternoon. And this session is about quantum computing. And I think a lot of discussion has been on generative AI. And we know that it's going to change uh, the way we do things, especially in financial services. But there's another very interesting development in the computing space, which is quantum computer. And we think, too, this is going to revolutionize the financial sector, and it's going to offer us many capabilities that could enhance data security, especially in the area of cryptography, and improve customer experience and streamline operations. But with all these possible updates that we're going to talk about today, will come regulatory implications and risks. So in this session, we are very blessed to have very good uh, uh, experts here uh, and professionals in their own field. Uh, let me introduce them. We have uh, Mr. Kenneth Xiao, the Regional Director for Southeast Asia for Tencent Cloud, who's sitting right next to me. Uh, I, we have Dr. Ritika Dusset, who's the Chief Innovation Officer for and Executive Di Director of Nucleus Software Exports Limited, and of course we have Dr. Marco Pistola, which is PhD and a Managing Director and Head of Global Technology Applied Research of JP Morgan. Right. This is going to be a very very interesting session because not many people know what quantum computing is about. So I'm going to start with a very basic uh, to ask our physicist uh, Ritika. Perhaps you can explain to us. What is a qubit and what's the difference between a classical computer that we use, most of us are using, and a quantum computing? Thank you, David. Um, first of all, I'd like to say that I am not a quantum computing expert, but I'm a physicist who has worked on quantum technologies in the past. Um, so, a quantum bit, which is called a qubit, is a, is a sort of a state. Uh, so with regular bits, you have zeros and ones, um, which can be encoded in um, a semiconductor. Uh, for a qubit, you can encode uh, an up state or a down state or zero one in a quantum manner. Um, so that is typically the spin of an atom or spin of that particular um, device. Um, and it can be controlled in, uh, through either magnetic fields or electric fields or microwave pulses. It's, it's a very uh, unique kind of uh, transistor that, that's getting built up at Google and, uh, and IBM and, of course, other places. Um, so you can still imagine zeros and ones, but the, the way it is controlled and the way it manifests uh, is, is quite different. I'm not sure if I did a good job. Yeah, I, I think you explained quite clearly to those, those of us who understand a little bit about quantum computing, but I think to the general public, it's going to be something really esoteric. So uh, maybe I'll just try to say something about it is that it's like um, you, when you use a classical computer, you're just using a computer uh, to do certain tasks which only can have two possibilities, zero and one. But in the quantum computing, possibly you can have a lot of 
different scenarios altogether with probabilistic probabilities turning up and as a combination of all this that sometimes I don't know how many of you watched the movie by Michelle Yeoh that anytime, anywhere, all at once and that's the multiverse which means that when we are in limbo, we are dreaming there's all the possibilities but the minute we wake up it's the real us in this physical world so in a quantum computer one way in the movie language or in our comics language is that we are in a multiverse there are many of us that can exist in this possibility of us existing in this universe but when we wake up and not in limbo state it is a real you that is feeling what is happening the pain that you feel and so on so uh, I suppose that's, the, that's one way to look at it but more importantly today we are talking about users and applications in finance so perhaps I ask Marco what is the potential of quantum computing why should we be interested in quantum computing sure um, so I would like to say that quantum computers as, as David explained and you want to put it closer to your yes quantum computers have a very strong computational power um, for every new qubit that you add to a quantum computer the computational power of the quantum computer doubles um, so if you take uh, um, a computer with uh, um, say 50 qubits the computational power of that quantum computer is 2 to the power of 50 which is a huge number um, so it's sort of different from a computer with uh, 50 bits so uh, just to give you an idea of the computational power of a quantum computer um, if you take uh, if you don't mind I'll go into something that is not related to um, finance for a moment let me go to uh, an example coming from chemistry which is actually the reason why quantum computers were introduced to begin with you know to simulate physical phenomena so uh, if you uh, take the molecule of caffeine um, and you want to simulate the molecule uh, in a, on a computer which is something that a pharmaceutical company would do they would probably not simulate the molecule of caffeine because it's a molecule that occurs naturally so there is no reason to uh, like model it uh, using a computer but typically pharmaceutical companies do that when they are creating a new drug a new molecule for a medicine so the molecule of caffeine um, if you want to simulate it, you will require a, that would require a classical computer with a number of bits equal to 10 to the power of 48. Just to give an idea of how big this number is, the number of atoms of our planet is estimated to be 10 to the power of 49. So uh, you would you would need a computer with uh, a number of bits equal to one tenth of the number of atoms of our planet. There is never going to be a classical computer like that. But with only 160 qubits, you will be able to simulate calcium on a quantum computer. And indeed, 2 to the power of 160 is equal almost to 10 to the power of 48. And this shows the, comp the computational power of a quantum computer. How do we apply this to finance? Well, it's interesting because the simulation that I've just described to you for a molecule to compute the ground state the molecular energy of a molecule uh, is actually an optimization problem so it's the same type of algorithm that we would use for portfolio optimization in portfolio optimization we have uh, problems that explode in complexity because they're exponential on the number of assets and the number of constraints in, uh, uh, in the portfolio so uh, these problems we solve them today in uh, finance but we solve them using approximations so uh, in uh, finance uh, we need to pro solve problems immediately, like on the, on the fly, because the market is volatile and time is of the essence, and we also need um, accuracy. So all these problems like portfolio optimization, derivative pricing, risk analysis, a lot of problems in the realm of machine learning uh, have very high complexity, and uh, uh, we solve them today using heavy approximations. We, sh we don't want to do that anymore with quantum computers we will gradually reduce the approximations and as the number of qubits grows we will be able to solve these problems um, uh, accurately without uh, uh, having to introduce uh, false positives, false negatives or other problems 
So thank you, Marco. That was very interesting. Maybe I'll just add on to an example for finance. Uh, imagine that you are using AI to do fraud detection. So you can use AI to do your work more efficiently. Uh, you can use the traditional computer. Say, for example, you have 1,000 account. One of the account is a fraud. So in the classical computer sense, uh, you can actually go through every account one by one for 1,000 times. But in the quantum computing sense, it's like you have 1,000 accounts display right in front of you. And there's an algorithm called Grover algorithm that will display the 1,000 account in front of you. Immediately you can spot the fraud account because it's dirty, it's like t-shirts. 1,000 t-shirts where the classical computer has to unpack, whether it's clean, and pack it back, and clean. That's what classic com computer does. By using the Grover com uh, algorithm, you can just display a thousand of them. Immediately, you can spot that that T-shirt is dirty. That is the layman's way, the movie way, of telling you what con quantum computing can do with the quantum algorithm. So um, I, I just want to try to add on to that for financial application. Of course, there are many applications. And that's where I come to kind of, kind of we know from, you know, all of us look at the Gartner hype cycle. Every year, we look at new technology, and then they will go up all the way and reach a peak with the valuation, and then they collapse. We see that in crypto, uh, in blockchain, and then they will level off, and then they will stabilize and mature. That's a, that's a Gartner hype cycle. But for quantum computing, the hype cycle is not one year, two year like crypto. From 2015, is, we see quantum computer is always on the uptrend. It has never reached the peak. And now it's 20, from 2025, now it's 2023. We are still seeing it is on the up cycle. It has never reached a peak. It has never had huge uh, peak uh, valuation, and people are still going, trying to invest even more money into quantum computing. So uh, you're in the cloud business. So I want to ask you is that from the cloud business perspective, in May, you are one of the biggest. So you, you see the whole cloud space. How much do you think quantum computing is being used in the cloud business now? And, and Tencent, uh, do you use AI? Do you use uh, um, um, any other technology? And how far has this quantum computing been going? So, a uh, pleasure to be here. And uh, first of all, I feel very humbled to be surrounded by three PhDs. And uh, I, I feel a little bit uh, more intelligent just by sitting beside you guys. Okay, so. Um, yeah, very, very humbling uh, to be with you guys. Um, I, th I would say that uh, right now, uh, quantum computing is still very much at the R&D phase. At the practitioner level, uh, at least from an industry standpoint, we're still not so much talking about quantum computing. It's very much uh, how do we leverage the power of cloud computing uh, to drive greater efficiencies, uh, to drive uh, greater productivity, to drive more operational uh, cost uh, efficiencies, for example. And I think you mentioned about um, uh, leveraging AI to drive better fraud detection, to drive better risk control. Uh, again, these are, I would say, areas that a lot of uh, financial services companies are now thinking about, which is leveraging on existing platform, uh, leveraging on existing cloud infrastructure services, uh, leveraging on data that has already been collected, um, for example, through uh, either a transaction that's already happened in a financial institution, how do you harness that data and build on that data uh, on uh, a certain set of machine le learning model uh, and that allows you to then scale um, to a industry or rather to a, uh, to a level that is applicable for that particular use case. Right, so uh, not, not so much quantum computing at the industry uh, execution level at this point, but definitely something that is uh, something we're watching quite carefully. Yeah, so most, most uh, companies are just paying attention to quantum computing, but everybody is actually focusing more on AI, especially generative AI, that we hear a lot about in this Singapore FinTech Festival. But there, there are very important security concerns that we have, right? There are risks, especially for the banking sector because a lot of things that we deal with is have to do with cryptography. So and quantum computing is known to be able to crack some of the private and public key 
that we are using for our banking services as well, especially for crypto. Right, Marco, you have anything to say about the kind of risk that's involved in, you know, uh, not paying attention to quantum computing? Yes, actually, thank you for this question. I'm very passionate about this topic. Um, so, as I mentioned, quantum has this incredible computational power that solves a lot of problems in finance, but it also solves problems that we didn't want it to be able to solve. Uh, particularly, it would be able to play cryptography. How does that happen? So we know that uh, each one of us, uh, in the email system or each website, you know, we have uh, a public and a private key. The public key is accessible by uh, everyone, uh, and the private key is kept uh, privately, as it's supposed to be. Now, the problem is that a quantum computer can take a public key and uh, derive the corresponding private key. So this computation for a classical computer would take trillions of years, longer than the, the age of the universe. For a quantum computer, it is estimated that a quantum computer with a sufficiently large number of qubits will be able to do it in only eight hours. So this means the cryptography that we use today will uh, fall apart. Uh, now, uh, when will that happen? Uh, we still have a few more years. However, the challenge is already there because there is a new type of attack already happening called the Harvest Now Decrypt Later. So um, attackers are known to be taking snapshots of private communication today. Uh, they, save, they save this uh, data in their computers, in their servers, and then one day they will be able to decrypt the data when the quantum computers will be powerful enough. So in a few years, the data that we exchange today will still be sensitive. And uh, um, for this reason, we have to migrate our infrastructure to quantum-safe uh, technology. There are two technologies that have been identified so far. One is called the post-quantum cryptography. Post-quantum cryptography consists of classical algorithms so they don't, they're not quantum algorithms, they're classical algorithms. They run on a classical computer like our laptops or phones and so on. These algorithms are supposed to be resistant to quantum computing attacks, but there is no proof because quantum computers are evolving and new algorithms are discovered every day. So uh, it is still something that we need to do. But uh, there is another technology that we're firm believers in, and at JP Morgan Chase, we have a, a team working on this technology based here in Singapore, um, a, a team that is really very strong, I have to say. Uh, our team uh, is working on this technology called the quantum key distribution, which was invented in 1984. So it's already almost 40 years old. It's mature technology. Uh, it, it doesn't... Um, it is more mature than quantum computing. Quantum key distribution allows for two parties to exchange the same cryptographic key, which is a symmetric key. It doesn't require public and private keys. Now, when I exchange a key with somebody else, I have to transmit this key, right? So how is it possible that this technology is safe? When I transmit the key, uh, the key travels over the internet. And since I cannot encrypt it, I cannot encrypt the key, given that I'm not using public and private keys, how am I going to send it to somebody else so that that person and I are going to have the same key? Uh, this is done by putting the key in a quantum state. So the key is not zeros and ones, like a regular key, but it's a, a mix of the qubits. So zeros and ones at the same time. Uh, there is a, um, a, um, a principle of quantum mechanics called the principle of no cloning, that establishes that you cannot clone a quantum state. So any observer that sees this key traveling on the internet will not be able to measure it and uh, clone it because of the principle of no cloning. So in other words, to break quantum key distribution, you would have to break the principles of quantum mechanics, which is impossible. So I think quantum key distribution and post-quantum cryptography uh, completely mitigate or eliminate the risks of quantum computing breaking today's cryptography. But it's very important that we migrate to these technologies as soon as possible. We start now because of the harvest now, the crypto leader attack. Thank you very much, Marco. So maybe let me use the movie language again <laughs> to make it uh, something simple to understand. So there are two areas that Marco talked about. There's um, uh, 
successful to quantum attack. One is a private and public key, which is which is like a password and 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 your email address. Except that this password and email address addresses in most of the cryptography is not generated by a centralized party. It's generated by you yourself. But uh, you can you can get your uh, public key from your private key. So it's only one way. In cryptography, a lot of things is just one way. You encrypted it. It's very difficult to decrypt it. And this is the whole idea, unless you're a very powerful computer. However, there are, there are algorithms, quantum algorithms, that will be able to do some magic to the mathematics. One of them is prime number factorization, because the private and public key is just the private key is just a product of the public key and another, another big prime number. Now, to to get the private key, you you is if you know the, uh, to, the public key is a is a product of the private key and a big prime number. So you have a private key, you multiply by a big prime number, you get your public key. But if, if, you, if I give you a public key to ask you to find out what the private key is, there are many, many possibilities. So classical computer will take a long, long time to do that, years. Now quantum computer, as I mentioned to you, take on many states, probability. Parallel is very much like a, something like a probabilistic. They can work it out fairly quickly. At the same time, that when you have encryption, they are able to decrypt. But as Marco said, don't worry. When something very powerful, a powerful computer can, can decrypt, then you use a powerful computer to do the encryption. So therefore, the timing of it, getting to decrypt it, will take just as long. That's one way. And you probably do another method, which is that quantum computing is not good at everything. They're only good at certain things. So do those things that computing, quantum computer are not good at, they cannot crack it. So there's a simple language, the movie language, that I'm going to explain to you. I hope I have not said anything wrong, but uh, that's how I understand it. But the question is, how far are we from there? Ritika, you are, you are in physics, right? Yep. Why is it that we have spent so much money to create a quantum computing? What is the hardware requirement? No, besides hardware requirement, we have to do software algorithm and then we can apply the many processes. But from your understanding, why is it so expensive to do a quantum computing? So there are uh, different kinds of quantum computers, but the most uh, famous kind is the uh, one that use, uses a superconducting quantum bit. And for one to achieve a superconducting quantum bit, you need to go down to very low temperatures. And you can only do that with liquid helium, uh, which is a non-renewable resource. So you need to go down to minus 272 point something Kelvin, the lowest temperature possible on Earth, uh, I mean, in the universe is minus 273 Celsius. So you need to go down to 30 millikelvin just above that temperature. Um, to go down to that temperature, it's, it's very hard. You need the fridges, the dilution refrigerators that use a combination of helium-3 and helium-4 um, in, in a certain ratio. And to run such a dilution refrigerator is hard. But to keep a dilution refrigerator cold for a long period of time is also very hard. So that's, that's one of the reasons why it's hard to adopt quantum computers. There are other kinds of uh, innovations going on that are utilizing trapped ions or um, neutral ions. Uh, for for storing the quantum bits, but they themselves also require high vacuums, uh, precise lasers. So all, all of these are challenges that the semiconductor industry doesn't face. So I'm hopeful because we transition from vacuum tubes to semiconductors and with phones in our hands, but I don't see a quantum computer in someone's pocket anytime in the future, recent future. Okay, so in other words, Maybe I should just use the movie language again, right? So what you're saying is that classical computer is so much easier to produce than now we use silicon, we just do a chipset, we therefore you can put it in my hand, zero ones is all what we have. But in the quantum computing, you, you need to hold the qubits together, whatever the qubit is. It's like a jackpot machine, right? You play the jackpot, 
they were all moved together fruit machine, right? They moved together. And your jackpot machine, they're all holding up together. So one example that I can give you is that you have to hold all this jackpot machine, all the fruits machine and symbols together in a vacuum where there's no energy. There's no it's low temperature, no heat, uh, no magnetic field, uh, totally vacuum. And we have to create the kind of environment for the hardware to make sure that the cubic are hold together like a jackpot machine. And they will not deviate from the kind of entanglement they have. But that is the very difficult thing to do. And therefore, it's not possible to have that in our pocket. You have to be in a lab situation where in a vacuum, low temperature, no pressure, uh, there's nothing. That's, that's why it's so difficult. It must be in a state of limbo. Because the minute you try to measure it, you rather measure it by light, you measure it by heat, measure it by um, you know, any form, that's energy. Once you have energy, the jackpot machine will break down. And therefore, you can't measure. You can only open up the box and look at it, whether the cat is alive or dead. But inside the box, the cat is alive and dead at the same time. Just like many of us in the multiverse. And this is what quantum computing is about. It's fascinating. You watch all the X-Men movies. That's what I told you. Is, that is multiverse, that we have all these movies. Am I correct? Yeah. So, but let's come back to more reality, right? That seems to be so fast, fresh away, that I'm sure there are some people who are doing quantum computing at IBM, Google, and so on. They are doing a lot of calculation, but at our level, we are still concerned about data security. We are concerned about customer data being taken care of at Tencent, right? Like cloud services. How are you doing that, Kenneth? Yeah. Thanks for bringing us back to reality. <laughs> uh, I think um, a couple of areas that I wanted to share, right? So, a lot of the quantum computing evolution, at the end of the day, it still touches on. Where is the, how are you harnessing data? Where are you storing data? How are you processing the data? So it comes back to um, reality in the sense that there's still nuts and bolts that you need to think about. Um, so at the end of the day, when it comes to a cloud hyperscaler providing some of these services, information security is very much at the core of what we're providing. Because at the end of the day, if that breaks, then nobody's going to trust you and nobody's going to use you. So the alternative is that you build that yourselves. I mean, whether you're into quantum computing, where you build those environments yourselves, but if you built it yourself, it's massive, massively expensive, not to mention, massively complex. So the, the alternative is that you don't build it yourselves. You then work with a hyperscaler that can then provide you with the baseline infrastructure that allows you to scale whatever that you're trying to do that allows you to drive stability. Let's say you drive, you build an application that leverages on quantum computing. But at the end of the day, you're trying to roll up with services that touches on millions of users at the same time. So scalability, stability, and not to mention security is ultimately the fundamental premise of what any hyperscaler cloud providers need to think about. So back to your question, right? Hyperscalers in general, not just Tencent, but in general, we would want to make sure that we are working with the regulatory bodies. So whichever regulatory bodies, because if you deal with a bank, you have in Singapore, for example, we have to deal with MAS, for example. But if you deal with, let's say, media services, we have to deal with IMDA. So that we recognize that there is no one size fit all. There are some fundamental security compliance and certifications we have to ensure. So, for example, in payment, PCI DSS or ISO, ISO 2701, for example, those are standards that we want to make sure that there is a baseline. But then when it comes to specific workload, when it comes to specific use cases, then we will have to take that workload, work with our customer, go to the regulatory bodies and ensure that we're helping our customers to be compliant with what the regulators want. And, and at the end of the day, this is a constantly ever-evolving landscape. Uh, is to ensure that we are in step with what the regulatory bodies want. Um, so, for example, in uh, MAS, there's MTCS Tier 3 standard. That is uh, uh, the highest standard when it comes to, uh, one of the highest standards when it comes to data privacy and control. So, we want to make sure that that is something that is in step. And again, if we take that conversation to Malaysia, to Philippines, to Thailand, it's a different conversation with... Uh, the regulatory bodies, and again, we want to make sure that we are in step with these uh, regulatory uh, compliance bodies. Yeah. 
these points are also important, right? We are always about worrying about data security. And that's, that's something that we always must take care of uh, customer data and so on. So I was just thinking about a scenario, just, just thinking aloud, right? This is a very interesting topic. Uh, I remember Y2K, we are all concerned about when we cross over from 1999 to 2000. And we had a huge number of consultants that turned out to do Y2K. Uh, and, well, gladly we didn't have any major problem. Would there be a case that, you know, how, how do we advise company now that in case there is a quantum computing somewhere that we don't know about that can crack all this private keys and public key that we have. So how, sh how should we deal with the kind of situation if you go into a financial institutions and you're in charge of uh, you know, quantum resistance or quantum application? Should we be concerned? How should we start taking precaution? And how should we advise the board of directors uh, if we are worried that there's some quantum competing somewhere they might just turn up in 2026, 2027. Marco, you have any idea? Sure. So I very much like the comparison with the Y2K because uh, in that case as well, there was the need for um, checking all the code and making sure that the computer was up to date with uh, the date with the date system. Uh, there is a difference, of course. Like, uh, with the Y2K problem, we knew exactly what that was going to happen. On uh, December... 31st, 1999, at 11.59 uh, p.m., you know, we needed to, we knew the date in which the bug could actually surface. But um, with quantum computing, we don't know when that uh, moment will happen. It's called the Q day, the day in which a quantum computer will be able to break uh, cryptography. We don't know because, uh, as, as you said, David, maybe somebody is working on a computer secretly, uh, and uh, uh, attackers will be able to decrypt our data. So uh, it's something that is almost like an unknown enemy that we have to watch for. And the second uh, difference, I think, is that uh, uh, with the Y2K bug, it was indeed a bug. Like, uh, so in the worst case, it would have caused uh, a system to crash. Uh, here we have a different problem. We have, uh, it's not even really a bug, it's just uh, an attack that can cause uh, the um, confidentiality of our communications to be uh, broken and so all the data that we are exchanging with other people or, or other entities will be decrypted. Imagine you know, healthcare records, financial records, emails and so on. So um, again, as I said, it's very important that uh, we start working on a transition. Uh, this requires uh, transition in all the software that uh, a company has uh, all uh, the hardware that in includes, say, cryptographic chips, for example, uh, the network, uh, and also the products that we buy from other companies. So remember, this is like uh, not just an internal vulnerability that our own code has. We also have code that we uh, borrow, we import from, uh, say, uh, open source projects, libraries, or we purchase from other parties. So we need to make sure that the entire infrastructure transitions to uh, new algorithms, or we can secure our infrastructure using quantum key distribution, as I mentioned before, that acts at the network layer. And so everything that costs, crosses the network is going to be encrypted uh, securely and safely. So uh, it's very important for banks in particular, for financial institutions, because we deal with so much uh, data that is highly confidential, and a breakage in cryptography can cause uh, a disaster in the financial industry. Thank you very much, Marco. So I'm going to pose another hypothetical question for pan panel members, because we never know when this quantum computing power is going to have, uh, you know, have some impact on, the, on our daily life. It's still imaginary, or maybe it happens, we just don't know about it. Uh, but should we make a guess for all of us here? When do you think there will be a mass adoption of this quantum or uh, quantum resistance uh, algorithm in financial institutions? Obviously, we, we all don't have an answer, but would you like to make a guess of when this mass adoption uh, in, in financial institutions will come about? 
So when um, um, are we going to have post-quantum cryptography, for example? So uh, the algorithms are going through a standardization process uh, in many countries in the world. So I think uh, the National Institute of Standards and Technologies in the U.S., it's called NIST for short, uh, is leading the standardization efforts. Uh, in 2017, they um, issued a call for algorithms. And uh, 82 algorithms were submitted. Uh, we're down to only four left right now, uh, of which three are for digital signatures, and only one is for key exchange, which is the foundation for encryption. So the standardization process is going on, and the uh, NIST uh, estimates that uh, the transition should be completed by 2035. It's a long time, but imagine how much work is needed. Hopefully, uh, we will not have a breakage of cryptography before then. Um, but at the same time, that's why I insist that uh, uh, it's very important to not pursue only post-quantum cryptography, but to look also into quantum key distribution, because that's already usable today. Marco, one more question for you. You know, when all these quantum resistance algorithm or distribution keys uh, and so on, does it mean that must be a cost, right? Does it mean that we have to have, instead of uh, SHA-256, we have something that 512, it requires more bit, requires more storage space, it slows down the computing, that defeats the original purpose of having quantum, quantum computer that be more efficient? But does that mean that? What's the cost? So, uh, uh, yeah, there will be a cost, uh, first of all, a financial cost, right, because we need to transition uh, all this uh, code. The code has to uh, be, um, to become quantum resistant, so all the cryptographic uh, calls in a, in, a map, in, a, in a program have to be replaced with new cryptographic calls. Uh, unfortunately, uh, doubling the length of a key, which is what we have done all these years, so every, as the power of classical computers grew, we took uh, uh, a cryptographic key and we decided that it needed to be uh, double, it needed to double in, in size, right? Uh, unfortunately, this doubling works very well for classical computers, but it's completely ineffective for quantum computers. Because a quantum computer, as I said, for every new qubit, its computational power doubles, so the key, uh, doubling the length of the key is completely ineffective. So the new algorithms, however, um, they don't require this doubling process, they're just new algorithms. However, I have to agree with, uh, with you, David, these algorithms are actually quite expensive in terms of computation. Uh, we, we know already that from a performance perspective, uh, it's unlikely that the algorithms that we see today, these new algorithms that have been standardized, will work on, for example, IoT devices and mobile devices. They're so expensive from a computational perspective that they require more uh, computational power to, to execute. So we need to continue this standardization process and study new algorithms that also run effectively on uh, IoT devices and mobile phones. So Ritika, do you have anything to add? Yeah, um, so I think there are two parts to the, to the uh, point, the Q-Day point. Uh, one is uh, having a powerful enough quantum computer, so the number of bits needs, qubits needs to scale up. Uh, and I'm, I'm sure many uh, labs around the world are working very hard to keep doing that. I remember visiting MIT, I think, uh, 15 years ago. And at that point of time, the number of qubits was around 7 or 13. And here today, we stand around 125 or more. Mm. Uh, we're pushing the boundaries. The other part is investments in the algorithms themselves, which um, you know, Marco talked about. So both of them need to move together and uh, keep pace with each other for us to reach uh, Q Day. Uh, the algorithms can be worked on uh, by individuals in their own homes, uh, but the, the quantum computers can't, I and mean, they require a lot of heavy investment. So let's see. So the algorithm is separated from the quantum computing in this present. Ken, have you have anything to add to that? Yeah, so I would say that uh, uh, quantum uh, computing and cloud computing, um, uh, Dr. Marco mentioned about system attack, network resiliency, and in many ways they go hand in hand. So um, the, the greater the speed of adoption of quantum computing, 
will also have a pull on effect on cloud computing because cloud computing will then be able to provide that overarching support structure that allows the quantum computing to be able to scale. So key to that, of course, is how do we ensure that uh, from a network level, from a resiliency level, from a data protection level, that cloud providers constantly think about how do we uh, evolve to be in step with the, uh, the evolution of quantum computing. So I think that's something that is uh, exciting, but something that we're watching the space quite carefully as well. Very well said, uh, Kenneth. I think with that, uh, the last 40 minutes, we have a short discussion of the kind of potential that we can use quantum computing, and I think the panel has given us a very clear idea of the uh, use, the use cases, as well as the potential, the risk, and also uh, the call for defense against your financial system in your organization. And uh, I'm, I'm sure you have enjoyed the discussion. I would now like you to put the hands together to thank our panel. Thank you very much. Thank you.